Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly and I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about a solved case which occurred in the summer of 2007 when a young woman was found dead in her home in New Jersey, the police immediately began trying to find the sadistic individual that had brutally murdered her. However, it was proving difficult as one by one they were able to rule out each suspect in the case and every line of inquiry seemed to just result in a dead end. But eventually, a breakthrough in the case emerged when the police made potential connections to other murders and attempted murders and they came to the terrifying conclusion that the perpetrator was probably a serial attacker, possibly even a serial killer, a killer who would be dubbed the highway killer or the truck stop killer. But quickly before we get into the case I would just like to say a huge thank you to Emma Sleep for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Emma Sleep is one of the leading premium sleep brands and I've had an Emma mattress on my bed for almost a year year now I want to say and let me tell you the difference that I've experienced with my sleeping pattern since then has just been incredible. I have mentioned before that I have struggled with insomnia for many years. One of my biggest issues was being unable to sleep all the way through the night. I would always experience interrupted sleep but I can honestly say that since having my Emma mattress I've been seeing big improvements with this. I mean don't get me wrong I still struggle with bouts of insomnia occasionally but nowhere near as much as I did before and the only thing that has changed is my mattress so that's the only thing that I can put it down to. The quality of my Emma mattress is just amazing and I feel so much more supported. Before I used to toss and turn basically all night because I could never get into a comfy position but the halo memory foam on the Emma mattress makes me feel so much more comfortable and I wake up feeling well rested pretty much every single morning. Like I said the difference I've noticed in my sleep pattern is insane and I literally constantly recommend Emma Sleep to all of my friends and family now. Whenever I hear someone mention that they need a new mattress, I'm on it. I'm sending them a link to the Emma website straight away. And what's so great about Emma is that they actually offer three different kinds of mattresses which each have like different features and benefits and on their website you can compare each mattress to try and determine which one might be the right choice for you. And there is absolutely no risk with the Emma mattresses because they come with a 10 year guarantee and a 200 night risk free trial. So if you decide that actually it's not the mattress for you then they will happily collect it and issue you with a refund. So if you would like to try out an Emma mattress for yourself or any other Emma sleep products, they don't just offer mattresses by the way, they also offer pillows and beds, mattress toppers and so much more. I recently got one of their weighted blankets which is honestly a dream, I love it. So if you would like to check out their products then right now is the time to do it because they are currently having a huge sale and you can receive a discount of up to 55% off when you use my code which is Molly Summer. The link to the Emma website will be down below in the description box. Once again thank you so much to Emma Sleep for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to you guys for supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. But just before we continue please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murders and attempted murders of several women and it involves heavy themes such as violence towards women and the theme of sexual assault is mentioned. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back about 16 years now to the summer of 2007 in Bloomsbury which is a little town located in Hunterdon County in the state of New Jersey in the US. Bloomsbury is known for being a very nice quiet area. At the time that this case took place the town had a population of only about 860 people. So it was one of those towns where everyone that lived there was very familiar with each other. It was a very friendly area and it felt like a very safe place to live because the crime rate in Bloomsbury was low. And so for that reason 38 year old Monica Massaro thought that it would be the most ideal place for her to live and I guess settle 
chilled out. So Monica Massaro was born on the 11th of August 1968 to her parents Frank and Faye Massaro and according to sources she actually used to live in an area called Montgomery Township in the state of Pennsylvania. However about three years before this case occurred in 2004 she decided to relocate to Bloomsbury in New Jersey. She lived in a lovely farmhouse on Main Street in Bloomsbury and she loved it. She loved living in the area. She lived on her own because she was a single woman and as far as I'm aware she didn't have any children so she was very independent and she was a business owner. She had her own company. She ran a house cleaning business which by all accounts she enjoyed. Apparently the business was doing really well and she was building up her clientele and as well as enjoying her career and her work life Monica also enjoyed her personal life. She was described by those that knew her as being a very sociable and outgoing person. She really enjoyed spending time with friends. She had a lot of friends. She was a very popular woman. She enjoyed going out and letting her hair down. She loved going to concerts because she adored music. She was just a woman enjoying her life, having fun and making memories. That was until her life was suddenly cut very short in late July of 2007. And concern for Monica Massaro was raised when she didn't turn up for work one afternoon. The date was the 30th of July 2007 and that day Monica was scheduled to clean the home of I believe one of her regular clients. However, oddly, she never turned up and she didn't contact this client to let them know that she wasn't going to come either, which as I understand it was very unlike Monica. I don't think she'd ever done that before. The client tried to contact Monica. He tried to ring her phone to ask where she was, but he had no luck. She didn't answer the call. And so he also actually went to her house and he knocked on the door to check if she was okay, but he had no luck there either. She didn't answer the door, which seemed strange because her car was parked in her driveway. So it seemed like she was home, but then why wasn't she answering the door? So I believe it was following this when the police were contacted and basically asked to conduct a welfare check on Monica Massaro. So a police officer was sent to her home on Main Street. They were actually able to get into the house because to their surprise, one of the doors to her home was unlocked. So they walked inside and the officer started looking around and initially it appeared as though no one was there because the officer was like calling out and making his presence known and he got no response. So he continued walking around the house and when he reached one of the bedrooms, this officer stumbled upon a truly gruesome scene. He walked into this bedroom and on the bed he saw the dead body of a woman. It was 38 year old Monica Massaro. And when I say that this scene was gruesome, I mean gruesome. There was so much blood in this room. Monica's bed was absolutely drenched in blood and Monica herself was covered in blood from where she had been savagely attacked with a knife. She had been stabbed repeatedly all over her body, including in her chest, her head and her neck. In fact, it was a stab wound to her neck that was ultimately determined to have been her cause of death. Her throat had been cut and the stab wound to her neck was so deep actually that it was very very close to her spine. But even after her death the killer did not stop. They continued stabbing Monica over and over again. In fact, the medical examiner determined that she was stabbed a further 17 times post-mortem, after she was already dead. There was no evidence to suggest that Monica had been sexually assaulted by the attacker. And another thing that they concluded in her autopsy was that Monica had been killed about a day or so before she was even found. So as we know, her body was discovered on the afternoon of the 30th of July 2007, which was a Monday. However, it's believed that she was murdered sometime on the Saturday night going into Sunday night before this, so probably on the night of the 29th of July. So as soon as this horrific discovery was made, a murder investigation was launched by the police. The hunt was on to find the perpetrator and the detectives did begin to wonder whether or not her case could have been connected to some other incidents that had occurred on the night that Monica was killed. Apparently, following the news of Monica's murder, the police became aware that on 
the night of her death, there was a prowler lurking around the neighbourhood where she lived. A couple of local residents reported that that night they had heard the noise of their doorknobs to their front doors being like shaken as if someone was trying to see if their door was open. And also there were reports that an individual was looking through people's windows as well. Now the police knew that the killer's entrance to Monica's house was through a side door which Monica had unfortunately left unlocked. Apparently this was something that she did often because she felt so safe in her town. Like I said earlier, Bloomsbury was known for being a very safe, basically crime-free area. So Monica never thought anything of it when she left her doors unlocked. So this side door was how the killer gained entry to her home. And this seems to indicate that the reports of a prowler in the area that night may have been linked to Monica's case. Perhaps this prowler was Monica's killer. He was going around the neighbourhood that night trying the doors on several different houses until eventually he got to Monica's and he realised that her door was unlocked. So he let himself in and that was when he brutally stabbed her to death inside her bedroom. Maybe the murderer was a complete stranger to Monica or maybe not. The injuries that she sustained during the attack seem to suggest otherwise. As we discussed, she was stabbed so many times, way more times than was necessary to kill her. And that indicated to the police that this crime was personal. It seemed as though the killer, whoever they were, held so much anger towards Monica. And they were taking this anger out on her with every jab of the knife. Perhaps the killer had a grudge against Monica for some reason. But then if that was the case, then who was it? Who had a grudge against Monica Massaro? who in her life would have had a motive for wanting her dead? Well, that is what the police set out to try and determine. Obviously, as part of their inquiry, they immediately began looking into the people in Monica's life. And one of the very first people that they looked at was actually the man who raised the alarm. That cleaning client of Monica's, he notified the police when she didn't turn up at his house for work on the day that she was found dead. Could he have been the killer? And did did he in fact raise the alarm as part of a cover-up because he didn't want the police to suspect him? And to be fair, it appears as though he did display some pretty suspicious behaviour following Monica's death. For starters, apparently when the police tried to interview him, he was just pretty uncooperative with them and also quite aggressive and confrontational. He didn't like that he was being interviewed as a potential suspect. But another thing that added to suspicion was that one once the police and forensics were at the crime scene after finding Monica's body, the police noticed that this client was watching from afar in his vehicle. He was just parked up in his car near the house and he was watching what the police were doing and then when he realised that the police had spotted him, he immediately drove away as they started walking towards his car to speak with him. So naturally, that made him seem very fishy. The fact that he was watching the crime scene. If he was the killer, perhaps he was doing that because he wanted to keep an eye on things, wanted to check how the investigation was progressing to try and gauge whether or not the detectives were close to catching him, who knows? So the police really thought that he could have been the perpetrator, or at least that was until they checked out his alibi and they were able to confirm that on the night of Monica's murder, he was actually nowhere near the crime scene. They had evidence to prove that he was down by the coast that night, the New Jersey shore, so that was the cleaning client rule. Out. Another man in Monica's life that the police began looking into as a potential suspect was actually her boyfriend or I suppose ex-boyfriend. I say boyfriend, ex-boyfriend because apparently Monica and this guy were very much on again, off again and it was very clear that Monica liked him a lot more than he liked her because he would see Monica occasionally but he was also actually engaged to another woman. So there was a love triangle 
triangle going on here. So a theory was that perhaps this boyfriend tried to break things off with Monica once and for all and she didn't take it well and that this led to an argument between them and the argument ended with him killing her. Or perhaps his fiance could have had something to do with Monica's death. From what I can gather, the fiance knew about Monica. She knew that her partner had been involved with her so maybe she decided to take matters into her own hands and get rid of Monica for good so that she could have him all to herself. It seemed as though both this boyfriend and his fiance may have had a motive for wanting to do this to Monica. However, ultimately their alibis checked out. Just like the previous suspect, Monica's client, the police could prove that they were not near the crime scene on the night in question and so they were more or less eliminated from the inquiry. But the list of suspects did not end there. Another individual in Monica's life who became of interest to the police was a guy who the police actually learned about through Monica's diary. She would often write in her diary and of course the police read through them after her murder in an attempt to identify any people of interest and they came across this guy's name. He was a friend or an acquaintance of Monica's. Apparently they met at a bar and they went to a concert together. They were both very passionate about music and according to a documentary that I watched about this case they dated for a short while. They had a bit of a fling but it never really went anywhere because Monica was still hung up on her ex-boyfriend. She didn't want to be with this other guy but he very much wanted to be with Monica and the police actually found that I believe at some point shortly before her death he had left a voicemail on her phone in which he was apparently heard crying and getting upset because he still wanted to give the relationship a go. So again was this a potential motive? If he wanted to be with Monica and she didn't feel the same could this have been a case of well if I can't have you then no one can. So following her death the police interviewed this guy from Monica's diary and bizarrely he actually claimed that he and Monica had never really dated and that he didn't really have any feelings for her which of course the police knew was a lie because of what Monica had written in her diary and also because of the voicemail that he had left her and obviously the fact that he was lying really made alarm bells ring for the police because why lie? Why lie about the nature of his relationship with Monica if he's innocent and got nothing to hide? So they looked further into him and they asked him where he was on the night that Monica was killed and he said that he was at a concert that night and once again the police could prove that that was true. He was at a concert that night so it seemed as though he wasn't the murderer. Why he decided to lie about his and Monica's relationship who knows perhaps he just panicked but regardless he was innocent so that was another person ruled out. The police continued looking into all of the other people in Monica's life but ultimately they could never find anything concrete to link anyone to the crime so the theory that Monica's killer was a total stranger to her began to look more and more likely and so with this theory in mind the detectives decided to turn to VICAP, the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program which was set up by the FBI and essentially what VICAP does is it allows police departments to input details of an unsolved crime that they are investigating so like an unsolved murder or an unsolved sexual assault case and then VICAP can search through their database to look for other crimes that are very similar and could be linked, could potentially have been committed by the same person. So for example, in this case, the detectives, I imagine, would have put into VICAP details such as, you know, the victim was stabbed to death, her throat had been cut, she was attacked in her home in the middle of the night, etc, etc. And then if there are any other cases with a lot of similarities to that, in VICAP, the police investigating Monica's case would be notified. And a couple of weeks after Monica's murder, that is exactly what happened. The police received information about another case which closely resembled certain aspects of Monica's case. The case that Vicap found happened in a town called Chelmsford in the state of Massachusetts on the evening of the 30th of July 2007. So literally just the night after Monica Massaro was killed. One family who lived in the town of Chelmsford was the McDonough family which 
consisted of married couple Kevin and Jeannie McDonough and their two teenage children. I believe they only had two children, Ryan and Shay McDonough. And the evening of the 29th of July was just a pretty normal one for the McDonough family. Kevin and Jeannie had been out for dinner and then when they returned home, they eventually went to bed. And their kids, Ryan and Shay, were both out of the house that night. I think they were both out with friends, but 15 year old Shay returned home just before midnight. Midnight was her curfew. So she got home in time for that. And when she arrived home, Shay actually decided to leave the back door unlocked because her brother Ryan wasn't home yet and she wanted to make sure that he would be able to get in the house whenever he got home without having to wake either her or her parents up to let him in. However, their mother Jeannie actually forgot to let her daughter Shay know that Ryan in fact wasn't coming home that night. He had decided to just stay over at his friend's house so the door didn't need to be left unlocked after all. And it was through this unlocked door how later that night a stranger entered the McDonough home and he attacked 15 year old Shay McDonough as she was sleeping in her bed. In the early hours of the morning on the 30th of July at around 4am Shay's parents Kevin and Jeannie woke up as they heard a noise coming from the bedroom next door, the room where their daughter Shay was sleeping. Jeannie described this noise as sounding like a whimper or something and immediately she assumed that Shay was having a nightmare or a bad dream and so Kevin and Jeannie both got out of bed and they went to check on their daughter and when they walked into Shay's room to their absolute shock and horror they saw a man, this big man wearing gloves and a mask literally standing over Shay in her bed and he was holding a knife in his hand. Shay was awake by this point, this man had woken her up when he came into her room. She actually woke up because she suddenly felt something cold pressing on her neck and it turns out that it was the knife. This man had come into her room and he immediately pressed the knife up to Shay's neck. Initially Shay thought that it was a gun but it wasn't, it was a knife. He pressed this knife against her neck and he said to Shay, quote, if you make any fucking noise I'm going to kill you. So of course Shay was absolutely terrified and she immediately started panicking. She tried to kick this man away from her there was a struggle and it was then when her parents Kevin and Jeannie woke up and they went straight to Shay's room to check that she was okay and as soon as they walked through the door Kevin literally grabbed this stranger and he tackled him to the ground and he literally put all of his weight on this man to try and keep him down on the ground and he started shouting to his wife Jeannie get the knife get the knife so Jeannie did she actually grabbed the blade of this long 15 inch hunter knife and she yanked it away from the attacker and in doing so she did sustain some injuries to her hands, some cuts from where she grabbed the blade and as Jeannie did this Shay immediately ran to the phone and she called 911. The attacker kept trying to get Kevin McDonough off of his back, in fact at one point he even managed to literally stand up with Kevin on his back, however luckily Kevin was able to get him into a sort of chokehold position and keep him down on the ground and until the police arrived at the scene and the attacker was arrested. Thankfully, the McDonough family survived this attack with no severe injuries. As I said, Jeannie did sustain some injuries to her hands, but she was treated in the hospital and the family survived. They were okay. But I honestly cannot imagine the sheer terror that they must have experienced that night. And it was following the attacker's arrest when they learnt of his name. The attacker was a man named Adam. Adam Leroy Lane. He was around 43 years old. He lived in North Carolina but he was a long-haul truck driver. That is what he did for a living. So his work took him to different parts of the country and to different states. He was married and he was a father to three children, three daughters actually, which is literally sickening to think about. The fact that he had three daughters of his own and yet he was trying to attack someone 
Alice's daughter. He tried to attack Shay, who was just 15 years old. And from what I can gather, he had no criminal record prior to this. So after Adam Lane was arrested, the police obviously started looking further into him and they searched his big truck that he used for work and they found some very interesting evidence in there. They found a couple of knives in there, like a knife collection, which was alarming, the fact that he kept a load of knives with him at all times. They found a couple of items such as receipts from like gas stations and stores that he had been to during his journeys in the truck. And something else that they found in there was one of those, you know, those like portable TVs with a built-in DVD player. And the DVD in this player was a film called Hunting Humans, which was a horror film released in 2002. And it's about, well, hunting humans. It's about a serial killer who would break into people's homes in the middle of the night and murder them. Now, of course, a lot of people enjoy horror films, including myself, so that alone isn't necessarily incriminating evidence. But I mean, the fact that they also found a load of knives in his truck and the fact that he had just been arrested for breaking into a home and attacking a 15-year-old girl, it it wasn't looking good. It was looking like maybe Adam Lane had taken inspiration from this film. He idolised it so much that he wanted to be like the murderer in the movie. He wanted to go out and kill people. And if that's true, then perhaps the attack on Shane McDonough wasn't the first that he'd committed. Perhaps Adam Leroy Lane was a serial attacker. It was a couple of weeks after his arrest when the detectives over in Bloomsbury in New Jersey, the detectives investigating the Monica Massaro case came across Adam Lane and the attack on Shea McDonough obviously through the VICAP system, as there were quite a few similarities between Monica's murder and what happened to Shea. They were both attacked in the middle of the night in their homes, in their beds. The attacker used a knife, he entered both homes through an unlocked door. In fact, if you remember, I mentioned earlier on in the video that following Monica's murder, there were reports of a prowler in the area that night. An individual was going around many of the houses and trying to open the doors, trying to see if any doors were unlocked. So the police felt confident that this prowler was Monica's killer. And it turns out that on the night that Shay was attacked, the exact same thing happened in Chelmsford in Massachusetts where she lived. There was an individual going around different houses in the area and turning doorknobs to see if they were unlocked. It's obviously believed that that was Adam Lane. He was trying to gain access to these homes until eventually he came across the unlocked door which led into the McDonough house. So upon learning about the McDonough case and the attacker Adam Lane, the police investigating Monica's case did begin to think that maybe the cases were linked. Maybe Adam Lane was the one who killed Monica Massaro. After all, he was a truck driver, and something that I neglected to mention before is that Monica lived very close to a truck stop in Bloomsbury. She lived just down the street from it. Her house was within walking distance of this truck stop. So if Adam Lane was her killer, then perhaps on the night of her death, he stopped at this truck stop in Bloomsbury and he walked around the neighbourhood, tried different doors until he came to Monica's house, found that her door was unlocked and so he went inside and he stabbed her to death. However, despite this and despite the similarities between the attack on Shay McDonough and the murder of Monica Massaro, the police did have their doubts that the cases were connected, that both crimes were committed by Adam Lane. The reason being because obviously the crimes happened only a day apart, Monica was killed sometime in the night on the 28th slash 29th of July and Shay was attacked just the night after on the 30th of July. They were only a day apart and yet Shay lived just under 300 miles away from Monica in a different state. Chelmsford in Massachusetts is about a four and a half hour drive away from Bloomsbury, New Jersey where Monica lived. So this made the police a tad sceptical. They weren't totally convinced that the cases were connected because of the fact that they happened so far away from each other and yet so close together in terms of time, if that makes sense. I mean, it's not impossible, obviously, especially given the fact that Adam Lane was a long-haul truck driver, but 
yeah, like I said, it, it did cast doubt, but not for long. It wasn't long before the detectives found evidence which very much put these doubts, this scepticism, to bed. You see, after the police investigating Monica's case learned of Adam Lane, they asked the Chelmsford Police Department, who were obviously handling the Adam Lane case and the attack on Shay McDonough, if they had found anything within Adam Lane's belongings or possessions that could have possibly been linked to Monica's murder and they had found something. If you recall I said that during the police's search of Adam Lane's truck they found some receipts in there and interestingly one of these receipts was from a truck stop shop in Bloomsbury in New Jersey, the truck stop that was just down the road from Monica Massaro's house. And the date on this receipt was the 29th of July, 2007. And I think the time on it was the early hours of the morning around like 5 a.m. The same night that Monica was brutally murdered. This receipt put Adam Lane in Bloomsbury. It put him extremely close to the crime scene on the night that the victim was killed. So it was upon learning about this receipt when the Bloomsbury police felt so certain that Adam Lane had to be Monica's killer. However, they of course needed stronger evidence than just this receipt to prove it, such as forensic evidence. Now by this point, the knives that had been found in Lane's truck and the large hunting knife that he had on him on the night of the McDonough family attack, they had already been sent off for testing to see what DNA evidence could be found on them. So whilst the Bloomsbury police waited for the results from that, they really wanted to, I think, conduct their own search of Adam Lane's truck to see if they could find any additional evidence in there that further linked him to Monica's case. But unfortunately, by this point in time, the truck had already been given back to the company who owned Adam Lane's truck. The Chelmsford police, who were investigating the McDonough case, had searched the truck earlier after Adam Lane's arrest for the attack on Shay McDonough and then following this it was just handed back to the owner who quickly got rid of anything else that had been left in there that belonged to Adam Lane. They just threw the rest of his belongings into a dumpster in a tow yard but of course the Bloomsbury police desperately wanted to go through those belongings again just in case there was anything in there that linked back to the Monica Massaro case and luckily the trash company had not yet picked up the rubbish from this dumpster. So the police were able to delay that, delay the trash company, and they went to search this dumpster. Inside the dumpster, they found a load of Lane's clothes and some shoes of his. And with these items and this clothing, the police also discovered some blonde hairs, long blonde hairs. And as we know, Monica Massaro had long blonde hair. So thinking that these may have come from Monica, the hairs were sent off for testing. Following the search of this dumpster, the Bloomsbury detectives then made the decision to go and visit Adam Lane whilst he was in custody for the McDonough attack. Because although at this point in time, they didn't necessarily have concrete evidence yet to definitively link Lane to Monica's case, because of course, course the forensic tests were still being carried out. All they had so far was circumstantial evidence such as the receipt but regardless they were still very eager to interview Adam Lane about Monica's murder just on the off chance that he might actually confess to that crime. So they went to speak with Lane, they started chatting to him and initially the detectives decided to just have a general chit chat with him in the beginning of the interview. I guess to try and make him feel at ease, feel comfortable in the hopes that he might eventually open up and tell the truth. So yeah, they were just chatting for a while, having normal conversations, until eventually they started asking him about how he got to Chelmsford in Massachusetts on the night that he attacked Shay McDonough. Like, what route did he take? What highways had he driven on to get there? And one highway that he said he took was Interstate 78. And Interstate 78 
Day does cross into Bloomsbury, New Jersey. And he actually admitted that he did stop at a truck stop in Bloomsbury in New Jersey on the night in question, the night of the 29th of July, 2007. And so the detectives asked him if he went anywhere else in Bloomsbury that night. Did he wander off away from the truck stop? And he basically said, no, he said that there's not really anywhere else to go in Bloomsbury. But of course the police were pretty sure that he was lying and so they just came straight out with it and they asked Lane if he assaulted anyone that night whilst he was in Bloomsbury. But again, he said no. And it was following these questions when the detectives noticed that Adam Lane's whole demeanour just completely changed. So before in his interview, when they were just having a chit chat, he came across as very friendly, very talkative. But as soon as they started asking him questions relating to the attack on Monica Massaro, he just shut off. He went very quiet and he quickly ended the interview by just saying, I'm done. He didn't want to speak to the police anymore. However, he he didn't keep up this attitude for very long because to the detective's surprise, just a short while after their first interview ended, Adam Lane said that he wanted to speak to the detectives again. So he sat down with them and in this second interview, Lane admitted that he was in fact the one responsible for the death of Monica Massaro. He confessed to the police. Adam Lane told the detectives that on the night of the 29th of July 2007, he was in Bloomsbury in New Jersey. He pulled his truck into the truck stop and he said that he began walking along Main Street, which is the road that Monica lived on. He was walking down the street trying different doors on houses to see if any were unlocked because he claimed that his plan was to rob a house that night. He said that he didn't intend to kill anyone that night, he just wanted to rob someone and eventually he came across Monica's house and he realised that her side door was unlocked so he made his way inside. He made his way through the house until eventually he came across Monica in her bedroom. She was in her bed and he claimed that as soon as he walked in, Monica sat straight up and of course she immediately started screaming because there was an intruder in her house and Lane said that this made him panic. Her screaming made him panic. So he tried to get her to be quiet and calm down but she wasn't. She wasn't calming down and so to try and force her to be silent, he threatened her with a knife. He held a knife to her neck as a warning, as if to to say, if you scream, I will stab you. However, Lane claimed that as he was doing this, as he was holding the knife to Monica's neck, she suddenly turned her head as she was struggling to get away from him. And as she did so, she kind of went into the knife, her neck went into the knife and that was what killed her. He basically blamed Monica. He said that he didn't stab her. She effectively stabbed herself because she moved her head suddenly. He was trying trying to claim that it was an accident. This is gonna kill my family. Mm -hmm. She sit straight up and got out of bed when she seen me and started screaming and I tried to get her to be quiet. I had the knife, it was on the bed. It's about that long and she rolled against it and cut right here. Best I could tell, and I'm no medic, it cut this juggler vein right here. How far across? Okay. Out here? Do you have any sexual attraction during any of this? No. Did you? Uh, Look, I love my wife. You? I love my wife very much. I ain't out for sexual choice. What happened next, then? She played to death. I couldn't lift the body. It didn't take very long. About how long? Less than sixty seconds. But of course, the detectives did not believe this for one minute. They did not believe that this was an accident. Firstly, if Monica did accidentally go into the knife herself, then why the hell was the stab wound to her neck so deep? Like we discussed earlier, it was close to her spine. It was that deep. And to the point where detectives said she was almost decapitated, that kind of severe injury does not indicate that she just turned her head and went into the knife. That suggests that the 
knife was plunged into her neck with force. But also, if the injury to her neck was an accident, then what about the other stab wounds that she sustained? As we know, Monica sustained numerous stab wounds to other parts of her body, including a further 17 stab wounds after she was already dead. If this was an accident, if he didn't mean to kill Monica, then what was the reason for the excessive amount of injuries that she suffered? So, of course, the police did not believe this accident story. They believed that this was a cold-blooded murder. Adam Lane went into Monica's house that night intent on finding a woman that he could kill, and he got enjoyment out of it. He didn't feel the need to sexually assault Monica too, because he got enough enjoyment and excitement out of just killing her, and he enjoyed it so much that just the following day, he set out to do it again in Chelmsford in Massachusetts. He broke into the McDonough's house to find another woman to attack and he found 15 year old Shay McDonough asleep in her bed. Thank God her parents were home that night and they went to check on Shay because if they hadn't, Lane definitely would have killed her too, for sure. I mean, if you think about it, the McDonough family are the reason why Lane was caught when he was. If Kevin McDonough hadn't been able to overpower him and keep him on the ground and in a chokehold before the police got there, then Lane would have escaped and probably gone on to attack even more women. Adam Lane was soon charged with Monica's murder. However, the police just had a gut instinct that this investigation was far from over. They felt confident that Adam Lane was a serial attacker and that Monica and Shay were not his only victims. There had to be more. And so they started looking into other unsolved cases that he may have been linked to. They started trying to like trace his journeys in the weeks and months before he was arrested for the attack on Shay to see if any similar attacks had occurred near routes that he had taken. And during this process, they came across two additional crimes that they theorised may have been committed by Adam Lane. The first was the murder of a 42-year-old woman named Darlene Ewald. She was a married mother of two. Her husband's name was Todd and they had two children together. They had a son named Nick and a daughter named Nicole. And the Ewald family lived in a house in an area called West Hanover Township in Dauphin County in the state of Pennsylvania. Darlene was described by her loved ones as being a happy woman who just wanted to make others happy. She was the kind of person who could always make you laugh if you were feeling down. She would always try to cheer you up and get a laugh out of you, which I personally think is one of the best qualities that a person can have. But tragically, on the night of the 13th of July 2007, so just over two weeks before Monica Massaro was killed, Darlene Ewald became the victim of a brutal attack just outside of her home on her patio in her backyard. That evening, Darlene was sat on her patio and she was just chatting to some friends of hers on the phone whilst her family, so her husband and her kids, were asleep in their rooms. They had all gone to bed. But Darlene decided that she wanted to stay up for a bit and, yeah, just chat to her friends on her phone. It was a really nice night. It was July, so it was obviously warm outside and she was enjoying sitting on her patio. However, sometime around the early hours of the morning at around 2am, the friend that Darlene was chatting to on the phone just suddenly heard her shout, oh my god, oh my god, in a very, very panicked voice, and then the phone cut off. It turns out that as Darlene was chatting on the phone, a stranger came up behind her, and he immediately started stabbing Darlene with a knife. She sustained a very severe injury to her neck. Her throat was just completely cut, just like Monica Massage Rose, and this injury was so severe that Darlene died. She died at the scene. The friend who she was chatting to on the phone was the one who found Darlene's body. As soon as the call cut off, they drove straight to her house and discovered her dead in the backyard. And when the police were called and they obviously launched a murder inquiry, they immediately suspected Darlene's husband, Todd, who was in the house that night. Darlene was brutally killed in their backyard, so the police believed that Todd was the one who killed her. He was the top 
top suspect in the case, or at least that was until a couple of weeks or so later when the police investigating Adam Leroy Lane came across details of Darlene Ewalt's murder in Pennsylvania and they started to suspect that perhaps Lane may have been the one who killed her just like he killed Monica Massaro. But Darlene's case wasn't the only one in Pennsylvania that the police believed may have been committed by Adam Lane. You see, just four days after Darlene Ewalt's murder, another very, very similar attack happened in Pennsylvania. This time, the victim was Patricia Brooks. She was, I believe, around her mid-30s at the time that this case occurred, and she lived in an area called Conewago Township in York County, Pennsylvania, which is just over 25 miles away from where Darlene Ewalt lived. And in the early hours of the morning, just after 2 a.m. on the 17th of July, 2007, Patricia was asleep on the couch in her living room when all of a sudden she woke up because she suddenly felt this sharp pain in her right shoulder. And as she opened her eyes, she saw a man, a stranger, standing behind her with a knife in his hand. This stranger had broken into her home and just stabbed her with this knife. However, before Patricia really had a chance to react, the assailant used this knife to cut across her neck. He tried to slit her throat and she literally felt how he started from the right side of her neck and cut all the way to the left. After inflicting this injury, the attacker fled the scene and thankfully Patricia's mother and her daughter were home with her that night. They were sleeping upstairs so they were able to call the emergency services and Patricia was taken to the hospital where she was treated for her horrific injuries and thankfully she did survive the attack. So again, when the police later came across Adam Lane, they began to connect the dots. They knew that he killed Monica Massaro because he confessed to that crime. They knew he was the one who attacked Shay McDonough and the murder of Darlene Ewell and the attempted murder of Patricia Brooks were incredibly similar to his previous attacks. They were all young women who had been attacked at their homes in the middle of the night by a man carrying a knife. So the police were certain that Adam Lane was responsible for the two attacks in Pennsylvania too. And eventually they had the evidence to prove it. They had forensic evidence. A couple of weeks after Adam Lane's knives were sent off for forensic examination, the results came back and scientists discovered traces of both Monica Massaro's DNA and Darlene Ewalt's DNA on the 15 inch long hunting knife that was confiscated from Adam Lane on the night that Shay McDonough was attacked. It was the same knife that he used to threaten Shay with. According to one article, the blonde hairs that the police found amongst Adam Lane's clothing in the dumpster also linked back to Monica Massaro. These were her hairs in the dumpster. They also had forensic evidence linking him to the Patricia Brooks case because following her attack, the police discovered a glove that her attacker had been wearing during the attack just outside of her home. He'd obviously dropped this glove. And from what I can gather, traces of Patricia Patricia's blood was found on this glove as well as Adam Lane's DNA. So that put him at the crime scene that night. And in addition to that, Patricia Brooks did pick Adam Lane out of a photo lineup as being the man that attacked her. He wasn't wearing any kind of mask that night. So she did get a good look at his face. So now the police had the solid proof that they needed to link Adam Lane to each attack. And as I understand it, because he obviously committed the four attacks in three different states under different jurisdictions, that meant that his court proceedings for each case would occur one after another rather than collectively, if that makes sense. So he went to court for the attack on Shay McDonough first, even though that was technically the last attack that he committed, but it's just because he was obviously captured that same night. So he was charged for assaulting Shay McDonough and he pleaded guilty to the charge. So he didn't have to go to trial. He just had to be sentenced 
sentence and for what he did to Shay, he received a 25 to 30 year prison sentence. Following this, he obviously faced a murder charge in New Jersey for the killing of Monica Massaro, which he again pleaded guilty to. And he was sentenced to 50 years in prison for what he did to Monica. And when he faced charges in Pennsylvania, he received life in prison for the murder of Darlene Ewald. It's believed he confessed to her murder in order to avoid the death penalty. And as well as that, he also received an additional 10 to 20 years in prison for the attempted murder of Patricia Brooks. So it's pretty safe to say that he will never be released from prison. And prison is where he remains to this day. Today, Adam Lane is in his late 50s and he is currently incarcerated at the State Correctional Institution in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. Behind bars is where he will remain until the day that he dies, which is no less than he deserves. Now, many people believe that Adam Lane probably had even more victims than the four that we've discussed. Most people believe that he is a serial killer and that he used his job as a truck driver as a way to obviously find victims. He would travel along different highways to different locations, commit brutal attacks, and then get away as quick as he could in his truck. Hence why he became known as the truck stop killer and the highway killer. However, there has never been strong enough evidence to convict him of any other murders or attempted murders. And as far as I'm aware, he has never confessed to any other crimes. So if he was responsible for more attacks, he's keeping very, very tight-lipped about them. In the aftermath of all of this, Shay McDonough's mother, Jeannie McDonough, published a book about this case. It's called Caught in the Act. If you are interested in reading her book, I will leave a link to where you can purchase it down below in the description box. As devastating as Adam Lane's crimes were, something that is really, really lovely to hear is that each family of each victim really did seem to come together. They really stood together in solidarity and they made sure that they were there to support one another during each part of Adam Lane's court proceeding because, I mean, they all had this connection for life now. Through heartbreaking circumstances, they had this connection because of what Adam Lane did to them and to their loved ones. In fact, Darlene Ewalt's daughter, Nicole, said in a documentary that I watched that Jeannie McDonough has even become like a second mother to her now. Of course, Jeannie was never going to be able to replace Nicole's real mum, Darlene, but Jeannie has just, just been there every step of the way to support Nicole. They speak often on the phone and they tell each other that they love one another. It's just so nice that Nicole can still have that kind of mother figure in her life through Jeannie. That really brought a tear to my eye when I was researching this case. My heart goes out to the families of the victims and to the survivors, Shay and Patricia. I can't even begin to comprehend just how much trauma their attacks must have left them with. But that concludes this case. That is the case of Adam Leroy Lane. Please do let me know in the comments your thoughts and opinions on the case. Do you think that Adam Lane had more victims? Let me know. And also, of course, feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Again, you can let me know in the comments down below or alternatively, I do have a case request form linked in the description box. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!